Welcome to Inspiration and Transformation from the Banks of the Ganga with Sadvi Bhagwati Saraswati, an American sannyasi living at the Parmarth Nikitan Ashram in Rishikesh, India. Sadvi is president of the Divine Shakti Foundation, a charitable organization bringing education, vocational training, upliftment, and empowerment programs to women and children. Sadvi is also Secretary General of the Global Interfaith Wash Alliance and Director of the world famous International Yoga Festival. Join the musings of an American sannyasi as Sadvi shares the wisdom and teachings of her Guru, His Holiness Pujya Swami Chidanand Saraswatiji. Welcome, everyone, to Inspiration and Transformation from the Holy Banks of the sacred Ganga River in the land of Rishikesh, India. So, uh, this evening on the Ghat in the Arati, Pooja Swamiji was speaking about oneness and togetherness and the, the beauty of the teachings from our scriptures that could be pretty much summed up in the line, respect, love your own, worship your own, but respect all. Worship the divine however you worship. Whatever path, whatever religion, whatever form, whatever name, or no name or no form, doesn't matter. Worship in your own way, whatever that may be. But respect other people's ways. And so he's asking, how do I do that? And especially, how do I do that with people who don't respect my way? And is that even necessary? Do we even need to have that conversation? The idea of worship your own but respect all could be extended into almost every area of our lives. If you substituted the word worship for love or enjoy or live by your own but respect all, then it could be a teaching about Not just your religion, it could be a teaching about how you feel about your own mother or father, right? So everybody loves their mom or their dad, but we respect other people's moms and dads. Everybody lives by their own sexual orientation, but we should respect others. People have their own gender identity, we respect others. People have their own path that they choose in life. Their dharma, you could say, that they walk. But we respect all. So the best way to do that really is, interestingly, the more comfortable you feel with your choices, the more open you tend to be to other people's choices. You know, they always say the ex-smokers are the ones who are the most ardent and passionate and even obnoxious to those who are still smoking. That if you've never smoked, you tend not to be that judgmental of those who do. You may not want to be near it. You may say, you know, don't smoke in my house. But you're not going to necessarily be that judgmental. But those who are ex-smokers tend to be the ones who are the most judgmental of those who still smoke. So, meaning my own now not smoking, is something I'm not yet so fully comfortable in. And in order to feel comfortable, I need to point my finger at others. In order to feel comfortable about my choice, I judge other people. So one of the most powerful ways to actually stop judging others 
and to start respecting them is to actually feel really deeply comfortable in yourself. The more comfortable we are in ourselves, the more we create the space for other people to be comfortable in their selves, themselves. The more peaceful and happy and whole I feel, the more of a container I create to bring other people peace and joy, comfort. So that's the first piece. The second piece is an awareness that, especially when you're talking about religion, that really, they're all just different paths to the same place. We're all going to the same place. Just in different ways, different names, different forms. You know, one of the ways that I, I like to think about it, because even within Hinduism, there's so many different ways to worship God. There's so many different names, forms, paths. And there's even intra-religion conflict between different paths. And the way that I like to think about it is you think, okay, I, I love Karen, who's sitting right here. And I love her so much. And I, I tend to be someone who's an eyes person. And so when I write about her, maybe I write poems, maybe I write songs, maybe I'm a sculptor, I'm going to write poems and songs about how beautiful her eyes are and how I can see my soul in her eyes and I'm going to paint pictures of her eyes. But Preeti sitting next to her also loves her. And maybe, maybe Preeti likes to have a hand to hold on her, her journey through life. And so she's going to write poems and songs about Karen's hands. Strong, firm, but also soft, smooth, always there. She's going to draw pictures and make sculptures of hands. And maybe someone else also loves her very much, but they... They're at a time in their life when they need a shoulder to cry on. And so they're going to write poetry and songs and whatnot about how wonderful her shoulder is. Just broad enough for their head to be there, but soft, not bony. Right? And they're going to they're gonna do pictures and sculptures of shoulders. Now, we all understand we're loving the same woman. No problem. The problem becomes in our descendants. Now you fast forward thousands of years. My descendants think that Karen is eyes. Preeti's descendants think Karen is a hand. Someone else's descendants think Karen is shoulder. And now we fight and we kill each other. We hate each other. Because we've lost the perspective that we're, we're talking about the same divine energy. I mean, one of the things every religion agrees on is God is infinite. I don't know of any religion that says God only exists in this box over here. That's not God. If God lives in a box, it's not God. God is infinite. So if God is infinite by nature, it means that God can be known in infinite ways. That God has manifested. Whether we believe in a form or not in a form, in multiple forms, in one form, whatever it may be. But that that energy has an infinite number of possibilities. And so we love, we worship the way that we connect to God. I'm an eye worshiper. Preeti's a hand worshiper, no problem. 
As long as we don't limit ourselves to thinking that that's all God is. And so, for you, I would say, try to think about God like that. That, okay, yeah, this is my way in. I mean, think about Ganga here. The point is to get in Ganga. Whether you go down our steps at Parmarth Nikatan, or you go downriver a bit and you go in from Gita Bhavan's Ghat or Van Prastashram's Ghat, or you go upriver and you go in from the sandy beach at Ramjula, or you jump in from a rock up at Lakshmanjula, it doesn't matter. What matters is that you get in. Ganga's not giving extra blessings to people who get in one way versus the other way. She's not saying, oh, you're the one who did the triple flip off the rock. Okay, you get, you know, the best blessings. It doesn't matter how you get in. So worship your own, love it, use your path. It's perfect for you. But recognize other people get in different ways. And that's also okay. And when you're with people who don't respect you, you know, it really depends. It depends how important the relationship is to you. Whether it's really worth getting into it about. I mean, look, there's no way that everybody is going to like you. There's no way everyone's going to respect you. It's just part of the package deal of a life in which you actually know a lot of people. Inevitably, there will be people who don't respect you, whether it's your religion, whether it's what you look like, whether it's what you do. I mean, we've got an innumerable number of reasons not to like someone if we don't want to. But don't let that determine your life. Somebody likes you, doesn't like you, respects you, doesn't respect you. That doesn't need to determine how you feel. So in general, you may not necessarily want to waste all of your time trying to get everyone to respect you. But if there are people you're close with, And you feel that there might actually be an educational possibility. A possibility of opening. Then why don't you share with them? Share with them the idea that, you know, you you love God. And they love God. And maybe, maybe you all could just agree to love God in different ways. But if they can't, don't blame them. You know, my really good friend, my first year at Stanford, she lived down my my dorm hall. She was a, a devout Christian. I come from a Jewish family, but I was not religious. She was very religious. And she used to try to convert me to get me to come to Bible study and whatnot. Now, we were 18, 19. Religion was the farthest thing from my mind. It was my first year at college, right? I mean, it was all about work and school and parties and boys and whatnot. The last thing I was thinking about was Bible study or my my religion or anybody else's religion. And I remember saying to her, Laura, just drop it. Let's just be friends. You know, I won't, I won't talk to you about religion. You don't talk to me about religion. And let's just... And she said to me something that has stuck with me since then. She said, I talk to you about it because I love you. She said, if you were dying of cancer and I were convinced that I had the cure to cancer, what kind of a friend would I be? if I didn't try to force you to take the the cure. And 
it's stuck with me all these years because you realize, okay, well, they may not necessarily be trying to change you or not respecting you because they're awful or horrible people or narrow-minded people. But it may actually be something as simple as what my friend said to me. In her religion, they are taught, bring other people in. She was doing what she was told was the right thing to do. And so maybe you can just find it in your heart to have compassion and love and even respect for other people's love of their own religion. Even if they don't necessarily respect you. And hopefully, hopefully your respect of them will make them respect you. When we get treated with respect, we tend to respond with respect. So see whether you can be the one to open that up for them and create a, a container of love and respect. And it's important to talk about because in our world, there's way too much violence around religion. And if we don't become active in our acceptance and our embrace of others, then we become silent contributors to conflict and violence. So whatever your way may be, just make sure that you are living openness and respect and acceptance. You're listening to OTRFM, part of the IOM radio network. Being a radio host on IOM FM allows you to build your show on a rich platform with the power of the Internet to fulfill your outreach goals and connect with a very specialized and global online audience, unlimited by time and distance. OM Times Radio will provide you with web relevance, a recognizable conscious brand, and with the standard of excellence that has accompanied every single... Circle of Hearts Radio is a sanctuary on the airwaves. Join me, Grandmother Aliyah, in the circle on Sunday, 2 p.m. Eastern, as I share information to both enlighten and nourish your soul. Hi, this is Christina Ricci with Rain. Every two minutes, another American is sexually assaulted. If you or someone you know has been sexually assaulted, you are not alone. Help is just a call or click away through the National Sexual Assault Hotline. Please call 1-800-656-HOPE, that's H-O-P-E, or visit RAIN.org, that's R-A-I-N-N dot O-R-G. Brought to you by RAIN and this station. Welcome back to Inspiration and Transformation. I'm so glad to have you all back here with me. It's difficult to implement because of this thing called maya. This illusion that keeps pulling us out of our truth. We know the path to real happiness is spirituality. But you walk out into the world and everything is shining and blinking and calling you. Come here, buy this, do this, you'll be happy. And so we get swept up. It's very bright, it's very loud, it's very compelling. And so we get swept up by it. But don't worry. Don't get upset with yourself. It's like meditation. We get distracted, we come back. You get distracted, just, just come back. But use also your power of introspection to remind yourself every day. At the end of the day, check in. When you were living spiritually, when you were offering to God, how did it feel? And when you were not, how did it feel? And just ask yourself, look back over the day and really allow your conscious mind 
to become really clear that actually you are happier. You are actually more at peace. You are actually enjoying your life more. It's not a burden. It's not a drudgery. It's not like studying in school, a subject that you hate because, you know, you want to get into college and so you've got to get an A in this class. It's actually something that when we do it, the rewards are immediate. We feel happier. We feel more at peace. If you ask people to list the 10 best moments of their life, I mean, just think about it in your own mind, the best moments of your life. They're all going to be moments that are rooted in connection. Connection to the divine. Connection to yourself. Your true self. Connection to others on a very, very deep level of a soul-to-soul connection. Nobody's best moment in life was when they got a new car. Nobody's best moment in life was when they got a raise or the, you know, interest rates went up or stock market went up. And so now they've got, you know, some more money in the bank. These are not the best moments of our life. So use your own power of contemplation of introspection. So it's not just you're doing it because you came to satsang and I said you should, or because you read a beautiful scripture and the scripture said you should. Think about it purely in a selfish way. It's actually what's bringing you the greatest joy. And so naturally, we all want more of the real joy. So run after those moments. Create those moments. Make that your priority. Once you become really clear that this is not where your happiness comes from, it's going to be hard to convince yourself to run after it more and more. But you just have to keep remembering, keep remembering. And slowly you'll find that you're making those right choices. This is OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network. OM Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Om Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Do you have time to read that inspiring book or that blog post you've been meaning to get to? In your busy world, how do you improve yourself and keep your life going? I'm Lisa Kay, and my Between Heaven and Earth radio show can transform your life just by listening. Be uplifted with inspiring topics, positive stories, and ideas that really work. Between Heaven and Earth Radio is conscious living for your soul. Every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Mike Baldwin with People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. I grew up loving circuses and other traveling animal shows, but it never occurred to me what life might be like for the animals. Training wild animals to do things they don't understand takes force. Routine discipline with a hook or whip with the heel of a boot shows the animal exactly who's the boss. Don't patronize animal acts. Please contact people for the ethical treatment of animals. 757-622-PETA Welcome back. This is Sadvi Bhagavati Saraswati with Inspiration and Transformation. Mental health management requires a lot of different things. It's like saying, what's the best way to manage my physical health? Now, assuming that you're healthy to begin with, we could come up with four, five, six great ways of staying healthy. Get enough sleep, 
eat the right foods at the right times of day, at the right times of year. Get some good exercise. Drink enough water. Right? I mean, it's not rocket science. You just have to go to Google or listen to anybody these days, and there's lots and lots and lots of methods to maintain health. Assuming that you're healthy to begin with. But if someone comes to you with heart disease or cancer or some other illness and says to you, what's the best way to maintain my health? Well, these four or five things I've just mentioned certainly would be helpful to them. But they also need a lot more. They need some more very specific guided treatment. And it may fall in those categories. It may come under the right food. But it's not going to be just a matter of get enough fruits and vegetables and grains and stay away from meat and sugar. There's going to be something more specific, more tailored based on what your ailment is. And you may need something even beyond that. There may be medicine you need, whether it's allopathic medicine, whether it's Ayurvedic medicine, homeopathic medicine, naturopathic medicine. But there may be additional things required. And the same thing is true with mental health. So we can say if you are very mentally healthy to begin with, well, To maintain it, to stay healthy, some of the similar things, get enough sleep. Actually, lack of sleep has a huge impact on our mental functioning, on our mood. So does our food. So does our diet. So does proper hydration. Amazingly, so does exercise. And we would add, do yoga meditate, have a spiritual connection. A spiritual connection is one of the most powerful predictors of mental health. Have deep connection. Deep connection. Ideally, a deep spiritual connection, but also deep connections in your life with others. Serve. Use your life to serve others. Do something meaningful so that at the end of the day when you go to sleep, it mattered to someone that you got out of bed that day. Because to get up every day and not have any kind of a ripple impact upon the planet or anyone's life is depressing. I mean, the fact that the planet would be no different whether you got up or didn't get up, that's a very depressing thought, even if I'm not depressed to begin with. So assuming that you've got robust mental health to begin with, maintaining your physical health, bringing in a spiritual component through meditation, through prayer, through devotion, Yoga, great for the body, great for the mind, great for the heart. Service connects us to others, makes us realize how much divine flows through us. But if you're dealing with a situation where you've already got mental distress, Well, you may need a lot more than that. You may take components of that, but you may need more. If you've been traumatized in some way, if you've got anxiety, if you've got depression, if you've got any one of innumerable illnesses, if you're suffering from addictions, from eating disorders, from so much that we struggle with in so many ways. Well, some additional assistance is of great benefit. 
therapy. Again, there's a whole variety of different types. But some way in which you are working directly with what you're suffering from. And medication. You know, in some cases, for some people, for some certain periods of time, it's really helpful. I'm not anti-medication at all. As long as it's not used instead of doing the work. So if I'm suffering from depression, let's say, and I'm so depressed that I cannot drag myself out of bed, I cannot get out of bed in the morning. And I'm suicidal. I want to kill myself. And medication can help me get out of bed, keep myself from killing myself. Well, that's fantastic. But then I need to use the fact that I've gotten out of bed and I'm still alive to actually do my work to overcome my depression. It's not just, oh, now I take these pills and I feel better. The pills are that which are used to help us be balanced enough, have the energy enough to stay alive, to get out of bed, to do our work, to show up at therapy or counseling or yoga or wherever we go. So that we actually can heal. So I would definitely not say they're a magic bullet by any means. Because we're not just chemical beings. To say that medicine itself was the cure-all implies that mental illness is simply a chemical problem. And it isn't. Yes, there's chemical components But it's a problem rooted in issues of our society, issues of the way that we run our systems, our communities. It has to do with our individual experiences, that which we've been through. There's so much that leads to mental illness that's not just about a chemical imbalance. So... Medicine is not the cure-all, but it is fantastically helpful, fantastically beneficial for some people with some illnesses for some period of time. And I'm all in favor of that. It's like if you've got diabetes and you're going to die from diabetes, Long before you can get your exercise program we're working, long before your lifestyle changes and eating habits changes can bring down your blood sugar. By all means, take whatever you need to take to keep your blood sugar low enough that you don't die. While you bring about lifestyle changes, so that ultimately you can take less and less of the medicine and even ideally at some point be able maybe to go off it. So I think of psychological medicines in the same way. They're things that we use, ideally temporarily, to help us through a period of time to be able to do the work that we need to actually heal. Now, there are some illnesses, psychotic illnesses mostly, in which people will be medicated for most of their lives. People with schizophrenia, for example, will be medicated for most of their lives. People with some forms of bipolar disorder will be medicated for most of their lives because there is a huge chemical component that doesn't respond nearly so well at all to non-chemical forms of treatment. But what's most important is to realize there's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't make you weak. Any more than needing medicine for diabetes makes you weak. The point of our life is to use all tools that we have to live a life that is 
meaningful, fulfilling, deep, connected, in love, in peace, in awareness, in joy. And if a medication can help me find that when I'm unable to find it, for a period of time as I learn the way to find it myself, There's nothing to be ashamed of there. Lastly then, in terms of the yoga and meditation just help us manage the anxiety or become free, we can become free. It's it's one of the greatest truths of the world and it's an interesting thing to talk about because just... Today, exactly, is the day that Jaiko, which is a a big Indian publisher, has released today the Indian edition of my memoir called Hollywood to the Himalayas. And it was published last summer in America, but the Indian edition taken up by Jaiko has literally just come out today. And I I mention that here because my journey was a journey of healing and transformation, as the subheading of the book is. I struggled a lot. I suffered a lot. I found, through spirituality, through yoga, through meditation, through surrender, through devotional practices, through inquiry and gyan and study, actual freedom from it. I used to think before I came to India that the best you could do was manage your life. I was 25 and to me that was the highest goal. I had learned personally, to manage my life. There had been times of my life when I wasn't managing it nearly so well. But by the time I was 25, I had gotten to a point where I felt like I was managing. I was managing my pain. I was managing my anger. I was managing my struggles. I was managing my relationships. I was managing my school. I was in the midst of getting my PhD in child neuropsychology. Because that's an interesting thing about mental health and mental illness is remarkably a lot of us, even as we suffer, are amazingly highly efficient and effective and you would have no idea from the outside in how much we're suffering. So you can't, and it's an important point to mention on Mental Health Awareness Day. People struggling with anxiety, with depression, with addiction, with all of that we struggle with, do not necessarily look different. They don't necessarily writhe around on the floor in pain and anguish for everyone to kind of walk around them like this is a person in trouble. We don't all stand on soapboxes on a corner and people cross the street because we look really crazy. A huge percentage of people who are suffering are highly proficient in so many ways. But it wasn't until I came to India that I actually discovered I could be free, not just manage, that it wasn't about management. It was about freedom. So as we start to get the beautiful blessings of Akash Ganga, the the Ganga from the sky, yes, you can be free. Yoga, meditation, spirituality, doing your own work. You've got to do the work to let go of that which is creating the anxiety of those patterns. And then, yes, you actually can become free, not just manage it.
This is OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network. OM Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment, a philanthropic organization. Their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. OM Times co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Do you have time to read that inspiring book or that blog post you've been meaning to get to? In your busy world, how do you improve yourself and keep your life going? I'm Lisa Kay, and my Between Heaven and Earth radio show can transform your life just by listening. Be uplifted with inspiring topics, positive stories, and ideas that really work. Between Heaven and Earth Radio is conscious living for your soul every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Like Baldwin with people for the ethical treatment of animals. I grew up loving circuses and other traveling animal shows, but it never occurred to me what life might be like for the animals. Training wild animals to do things they don't understand takes force. Routine discipline with a hook or whip with the heel of a boot shows the animal exactly who's the boss. Don't patronize animal acts. Please contact people for the ethical treatment of animals. 757-622-PETA Welcome back. This is Sadvi Bhagavati Saraswati with inspiration and transformation. Can you offer some spiritual advice to someone who has just started their spiritual journey. Like, what kind of meditation should I be doing? Thank you so much. What kind of meditation you do is much less important than actually doing it. I always say there's no wrong way to meditate other than hitting the snooze button and going back to sleep. That's the only wrong way to meditate. Otherwise, there's so many different lineages, schools, teachings. I don't think there is one that's better than another. I think in general, if you look back throughout history, our sages, our saints, our rishis, the yogis, they weren't all doing one form of meditation. They hadn't all gone to one guru or one ashram or one course. They were in solitude, in silence, in caves, in the Himalayas, in some cases under the tutelage of a specific guru, in some cases just on their own. And then if you look out at other religions as well, and you look at mystics and masters of different religions as well, they all had some practice of meditation, of contemplation, of divine connection. And it worked for them. And there's... Enlightened masters, mystics, what we would call yogis, they may use a different word, in, in so many of the different religious traditions, if not all of them. So there's not one way that's better, unless, of course, I'm planning to charge you a whole lot of money to use my way, at which point I would be sure to convince you that it was not only the best way, but it was the only way. But if you go back to the days prior to people having to pay large sums of money to learn a specific technique, there really was no emphasis at all on it must be this way or that way, this school or that school, this guru or that guru. What matters most is just do it. So... I would say the type of meditation you should be doing is the type that works for you. It doesn't hurt to try three, four different types before you settle on a 
specific technique. Give each of them, you know, a week, two weeks. You're not going to necessarily become an expert that quickly, but you'll certainly get an idea of whether you're making any progress. Is your mind quieting? Are you able to bring awareness, consciousness, love, presence into each moment? Are you feeling the impact of that meditation in the rest of your day? Or does it go away the moment you open your eyes and stand up off the cushion? And, you know, just give yourself a little bit of time. And if you want to give more time, you can give more time. Give a month, give two months to a handful of different practices unless you discover with the first one that this really works, then stay with it. If it works, that's your path. Otherwise, feel free. Try a few different things and figure out which one quiets your mind the quickest allows your mind to be quiet for the longest period of time, opens your heart the most, has the most lasting fragrance, right? If you walked into a department store and you paid a huge bunch of money for a perfume and you spray it on yourself in the store, but by the time you walk out of the store 15 minutes later, it's gone. The fragrance is gone. You'd think... Well, this is not a very good perfume. If it's a good quality perfume or essential oil, it should last. It should stay with you for at least a few hours, if not the whole day. So meditation should be like a fragrance. It should stay with you for as long as possible. It should ripple out into the rest of your day. So... Choose whichever one works. These days you don't even have to necessarily go anywhere. It used to be you had to go for a meditation retreat. These days you can actually just create a retreat at home. Go to YouTube. Listen to meditation videos. I mean, if you can, take some time out. Come to an ashram. Spend some time. Nothing like it. It's a highly charged atmosphere. But if not, don't worry. Don't feel like you've got to wait till you can come in order to start a meditation practice. Start it wherever you are. Whenever you are. Whenever it occurs to you. Just start. And then just make sure that you keep doing it. That you actually get up and do it. If you find that when you set an alarm for four or five Every single time you hit the snooze button and go back to sleep, set it for six. Set it for a time when you actually can get up. Because you're not achieving anything by setting an alarm for Brahma Mort if you don't actually ever get out of bed. You're much better off setting an alarm for a time when you can reasonably get out of bed. And then meditate. So, as you start your spiritual journey, yes, meditation is, it's critical. It's the foundation, it's the energy. But recognize also as you start your path that our spiritual path is not just that which we do on the mat or on the cushion. So while while it's very important to have a good meditation practice, a good yoga practice, Ultimately, your spiritual journey is that which happens when you walk off the mat, when you stand up off the cushion. And so as you start the journey, see how many times during the day you can remind yourself that you're on the journey. Otherwise, you'll remember in the morning for your meditation. Then you get to work or you get to school or you get where you're going and you completely forget. You're swept up. And it's not till at night you're about to go to sleep and you realize, oh my God, 
I'm supposed to be on a spiritual journey. I forgot all day. So make opportunities all day long to just remind the self. Some of the easiest ones are before you eat anything. Just before you eat. Take a few moments. Close your eyes. Reconnect. If you've got a mantra you like to chant, chant it. Say grace, be grateful to God. Or simply just take a few breaths and sink into the core of who you are. Before you drink water. And I choose these because they're things that all of us do every day, many times. And so it's this constant opportunity to just reconnect and remember. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Because life is full of distractions. You could set a reminder on your phone every half an hour. Just a little bing. Let it be the only notification that actually goes off. Just to remind you. Maybe instead of a bing, you can program it to say om. Whatever you want to do. Get creative. Use that which you're already doing in your day to help remind you that you're on a spiritual journey. And choose choose love and choose peace as much as you can. For me, those are really the cornerstone of a spiritual journey. As I move through the day, there's so many opportunities to be upset, to be stressed, to be frustrated, to be critical, to be judgmental, to be negative. Maybe it's just things of your mind. You notice something that makes you angry or you notice something that makes you upset. Maybe it's somebody actually provoking you. Maybe it's actually somebody in your face not choosing love, not choosing peace. Either way, whether it comes just from the depths of you inside or it comes directly from outside, there's all these opportunities to not be in peace, to not be anchored in love. But we have the option. Every single time, regardless of what the provocation may be, to choose love, to choose peace. And I think that that's perhaps one of the most critical pieces. I mean, for me, it's, it's core to my practice. Every minute, every moment. Am I choosing peace in this moment? Am I choosing love in this moment? And if not, why? Why would I voluntarily hand over my peace? Why would I voluntarily pollute myself with hatred? With judgment, with negativity? Love feels so good. It's why we love being in love. It's why we love romance movies. It's why we love romance books. I mean, whether it's us being in love or someone else being in love, we love it. Why would you choose not to love? Because, of course, love is so much bigger than romance. I mean, ask any of us who have chosen a path of celibacy. There's so much love in the world, so many opportunities to love. It doesn't require romance. Why would you choose anything else? Why would you choose anything other than peace? Peace feels good. That's why everyone wants to be in peace. So remember that you should 
always remind yourself that you have this possibility, this choice, this opportunity to be in peace, to be in love every moment. And that should stay with you as you begin your spiritual journey and as you walk it. This brings to a close this hour of inspiration and transformation. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm so glad to be together with you all each week. And I look forward to being together again next Thursday, same time, on Ohm Times Radio. Mm-hmm.